It's been a year since our school has been quarantined, cut off from the rest of the world. Because of what is here, what might get out. I'm sure one day the truth will come out about Blackwood Academy. Maybe we'll end up on the world news, our names written in history. Or maybe I'm just fantasizing about it. It's good to imagine though. I don't want to live in the dark anymore. I want to be known. I want our situation to be known across the world. I'm 17 years old and I haven't seen the sky in 12 months because the windows have bars in them. And even when I peer through them, I see green. I see vines that twisted around us. Trees. Like Mother Nature has taken us into her arms. At least that's what I want to believe. The actual truth would be just another attempt to hide us away from the real world. I even breathed real, proper air from the outside and felt the breeze on my face. I'm supposed to be graduating this year. I'm supposed to be going to college. I can't lie to myself and say that that's going to happen, because it's not. I promised myself I wouldn't go on and on about things that don't matter. But it's hard not to when I don't know how to start off a post properly. And do I start by introducing myself? This is my first post, so I guess, bear with me. I want you to know what life is like here, for the world to help us. For now, however, until we become public knowledge, our school remains invisible, forgotten. So that's why I'm here, why I'm writing this to you. I'm so sick of not existing. Sure, I used to make self-deprecating jokes about wanting to end it like the rest of my generation, but I didn't mean it. Do you know the story of Sleeping Beauty? I mean, of course you do. It was my comfort book as a child. The story of the princess put to sleep by the evil witch and locked away in a tower. Or a little bit like that. Though there are no sleeping princesses magical kisses or fairies. When I think of a fairy tale, I don't think of Aurora or Prince Philip, or the sleeping spell that she was under. I think of her tower. I think of her tower hidden deep, deep in the forest, eaten up by nature, entangled in greenery. That is Blackwood Academy. Like Aurora's tower, we have been locked away, eaten up not just by nature, but with the people pretending that we don't exist. Like it's that easy. Instead of being under a sleeping spell cast by an evil witch though, we are instead in a permanent state of nothing. Purgatory. Neither living nor dead. I don't exist anymore, according to the outside world. Like everyone else here, our names have been cruelly torn away, covered up. They've wiped us off the face of the earth and you are none the wiser to what is going on here. I would like to think that it's to avoid causing panic. But over the last year, I've been led to believe that in the case of the outside world, ignorance is bliss. You choose to turn your head and see the world through rose-tinted glasses. We're already in a pandemic, so I actively look for more threats to our planet. It's not like I blame you. If I was an outsider and knew even the slightest glimmer of the stuff that goes on here, I'd try my best to ignore it too. I guess what I'm here for is to be the one to put our story out there. I don't want to wait years for the world to find out about us, for the military to finally come clean and admit, oh yeah, those kids, they were dangerous so we got rid of them. Simple enough, huh? They don't think about lives that we wanted to live, our families back home. Their mouths sealed shut with a good hunk of cash that will allow them to retire. They don't care that we wanted to graduate, that we wanted to see the world, have kids and grow old. You know, the so-called American dream. They don't give a crap. They just left us to rot here, which I can understand, at least part of me can. I can understand that they're making sure whatever is here with us doesn't get out. In the near future, if we're discovered, people will ask, How did it happen? How did our school turn into what it is now? 
How did we become the so-called ground zero? Was it a gas leak? Radiation poisoning? Wi-Fi? According to my Grammy, Wi-Fi messes with the molecules. She didn't elaborate. One day, Grammy just came out with it out of the blue. She was also convinced that I had developed major health problems if I slept with my phone next to me or went more than two feet near the microwave when it was on. I can partially understand where she was coming from, but come on. I just wanted to cook my Hot Pockets and she was grabbing and pulling me away, like the thing was about to explode in my face. Anyway, no, no, and no. It wasn't Wi-Fi or radiation poisoning or bad chicken nuggets. I'm sure some other theory will come up at some point, but no. The reason behind the disaster and then quarantine of our school was simply an April Fool's joke that went wrong, orchestrated by my best friend. How about that, huh? My best friend ended the world, or at least the world around our school. Maybe this thing will get out soon. Maybe there'll be some kind of leak or outbreak outside. And then I can say she officially ended the world as you know it too. But until then, this is our problem. She started this and we've been living it for the past year. Well, not exactly living. I will get to that as I write. Up until April 1st, 2021, I had never done anything significantly bad. I mean, I stole the Twinkie on a dare in fourth grade to try and impress the girls in my class, if that counts. Mom treated it like I had committed a war crime and I was grounded for two weeks. So I definitely put that incident up there in the significantly bad category. I had never done anything truly bad, though. I used to think that as a teenager, I was invincible. It's the age, right? We all think that we're going to be that age forever, and there are no repercussions to our actions. I was never going to die, and if I was going to, it would be way later on in life. Or maybe I would off myself at 30 so I wouldn't age. That's what my mindset was. Toxic, yes. I was obsessed with my own youth and was convinced my time would never run out. I was a dumb kid. I still am a dumb kid, but being in this kind of situation has put a lot of things into perspective. For example, I can say my mom was right when she told me too much screen time on my phone would make me sick. I'm still unsure about the microwave thing now. Grammy always made some pretty wild theories. Maybe I'll tell you about them someday. If I get out of here alive, I'll make it my goal. I promise. Okay, so I'll start from the beginning. I thought the worst part of that day was getting rejected by Connor Marlowe. It was already a pretty crappy day to start with. I woke up with a crummy headache and there was no milk for my cereal. And I had completely forgotten about an essay which was due. It was April Fool's Day though. And I was looking forward to seeing chaos and so at school. It usually did. It was always a competition amongst the students and who could do the wildest prank. And that year was no exception. The whole school was eager to take Melanie Jason's crown. The 2019 winner. We don't talk about 2020. After she had somehow convinced everyone the world was ending by broadcasting one of those mock emergency alert alarms on the tannoy, alerting us an alien invasion was imminent and to prepare ourselves. Earth was under attack. Every Tannoyan school screamed at 9am when the majority of us were still half asleep. She even played the siren, so you can imagine how terrified we all were. I fell for it, of course, being a confused freshman, still half asleep from the Netflix binge the night before. I'd almost crap myself. Melanie had gotten suspended for it, though her argument had been that she had been mimicking the famous War of the Worlds radio broadcast for an assignment. Since then, Melanie has held the top spot. The prank was pretty good, admittedly, and she caught a lot of us off guard. I even heard that some teachers had freaked out in class, though that was unlikely. It turned into a game of telephone, rumors being spread around that some kids had panic attacks, some kids attacked others. I even heard one where two seniors apparently decided it was the best time to get it on, like right there. 
kids wanted to follow in Melanie's footsteps. I had caught offhand conversations and word of mouth that the next April Fool prank was going to knock Melanie off the top spot, and my best friend was eager to be the one to do it. I wasn't really thinking about Rory's prank though. I had things in my mind that morning, Connor Marlowe to be specific. I had been crushing on him for a while, you know. The butterflies in your stomach kind of crushed. I don't know what it was about him. He wasn't exactly conventionally attractive. Connor looked like he had rolled out of bed most days. He had dark hair and wore a lot of plaid, always carrying his beaten up camera everywhere, hanging on a ribbon around his neck. He was kind of awkward, but the cute kind. The kind that made me sort of fall for him. We were friends, having met in the school newspaper club. Connor took his work a lot more seriously than me. Though we had hung out a bunch of times and being a naive idiot, I had taken that as a sign that he actually liked me. Which was badly miscalculated on my part. If I had actually listened to word of mouth from classmates, I would have found out Connor wasn't really into girls. It was much later on, post the end of the world, when I find out about him, but at that point I was completely deaf and blind to any rumors. God, if only I would have at least some semblance of common sense, then I might not have made a complete fool out of myself and enjoyed my last minutes of what I called a normal. But no, I was an idiot, and I deserved it. I had already gone through our hypothetical conversation a thousand times in my head, and at that point, I just wanted to get it over with. The world could end. That's what I told myself, rubbing my clammy hands together. And then what would I do? I would regret not telling him. I was also running on three cups of coffee, maybe four, so I was practically bouncing with unhinged energy. Hey, Connor. I caught him on the way to class. As usual, he would be in his own world, thoughts in the clouds, nodding his head to music in his ears. I had to tap him on the shoulder to get his attention. Twisting around to face me, Connor's frown quirked into a smile. He tugged an earphone out. Hey, Mara, hey. He nodded at me, gesturing ahead. Are you, uh, are you coming to class? Yeah. I pulled a face, joining him. I didn't do the assignment. For which class? He smirked. Dude, we have a bunch. Uh, Mr. Tenor. Connor laughed. His laugh was one of the things that I loved about him. It was one of those uh, throwing your head back belly laughs. You know when their whole body vibrates with them. Oh crap, you're dead. I'm not dead, I said. And when I caught a smirk, I gave up. Okay, yeah, I'm dead. You're seriously dead. Connor nudged me. My condolences. I shoved him back. Shut up. He was right, though. I was pretty sure that I was going to die. Mr. Tenor, our English teacher, considered students who failed to complete assignments defects who didn't belong in his class. He was a bitter old man and seemed to thrive on humiliating students. I remember this one girl in our class, Rosie, forgot to do the assignment because her aunt had passed away a few days before. Mr. Tenor had mocked a sad face. Well, I'm sure your aunt would have wanted you to do the task assigned. Rosie had burst into tears and ran out. I found out the next day that she had joined another class. And I didn't blame her. Mr. Tenor was an awful human being. Seriously, screw that guy. The thing about Connor was, we only really talked about schoolwork and the club, so it was fairly easy to run out of things to say. What can I say? I spent most of my time on TikTok, and he was into, like, I don't know, indie stuff. He had watched the Midsummer Director's Cut at the movies and spent almost an hour talking about the cinematography and how it was a masterpiece. The only thing that I knew was that there was a guy who was put into a bear, meant something about some type of blood. That's it. When I told Connor this, he looked at me like I had just attacked his family. So yeah, we didn't share interests. And maybe he was slightly on the pretentious side, but hey, I couldn't help who I fell for. Connor just made me dizzy. 
the two of us started walking and made idle conversation about the weather and classwork, pushing through the crowd of kids heading to first period. And Connor didn't really speak, only offering me awkward smiles, his gaze flicking from me to his phone in his hand. He probably wanted to put his earphones back in. Is the school newspaper club still tonight? I asked him, knowing dang well that it was. The school newspaper held their meetings every Thursday at 4 p.m. in room 45HF, a music room. I usually spend sessions typing up random articles or doing my best to help Connor with whatever project he was working on. There were five of us. Me, Connor, a kid called James who never did any work, and he talked about his sex life in vivid detail. And Sarah, a quiet girl who always brought cake from home for us. Yeah, it is. Connor lifted his camera for emphasis, a grin spreading across his lips. He always got excited about his camera, like a little kid. I'm taking pictures of the new school gymnasium. He shot me a hopeful look. Do you want to interview the coach? You can come along. The idea of standing in the new school gymnasium which smelled like burnt plastic and bleach interviewing Coach Croft who was very intense when it came to interviews wasn't exactly my idea of fun. Still though, I found myself nodding. Yeah, is Sarah still doing the piece on cyberbullying? Uh huh. Connor idly played with the string of his camera as we headed up the last few steps. There were a group of kids at the top of the stairs yelling. My stomach gurgled. I really regretted drinking all that coffee. James is doing an article on the girls' swim team. He shot me a grin. Obviously. Seriously? I rolled my eyes. What is there to write about? No idea, but it's James. So I'm sure he'll figure something out. After a moment, I just came out with it. I couldn't stand waiting any longer. Hey, do you want to hang out? We had reached the top of the stairs and Connor turned to me, curious eyes drinking me in. Do you mean after the club meeting? He nodded, his lips curving into a grin. Yeah, sure, I'll text Sarah and James too. They've been talking about the new gods of the movie. If you want to go and see it. Crap, he was totally oblivious. Actually, I, I met the two of us. My voice was small. If you, uh, if you want to. Connor's smile fell. Running a hand through his hair, he shook his head. But his smile was still polite. Mara, you're a great friend, but I don't really see you like that. He said, sputtering out a nervous laugh. I actually, uh, he was cut off by a loud bang which startled me from my stupor as I took in Connor's words. I could already feel my cheeks heating up, my stomach crawling into my throat. Twisting around, I glimpsed the source of the crash, a guy who had just walked headfirst into a locker. I vaguely recognized him, that kid who suffered from narcolepsy. I remembered him becoming the talk of the school during freshman year, when he would sleep through his classes even drifting off standing up and walking into things. They called him a vampire. The crowd around us were laughing and the kid regarded them with a scowl. Sleepy eyes half lit at the ray fringe which was way too long, sticking under a knitted beanie. Very funny, he told the crowd. All right, everyone, get it all out. Let's all laugh at the disabled guy. His smile was mocking then. He was practically egging them on. Dude, just don't come to school. Joey Summers, a senior, standing a few feet away, spoke up. If you're gonna fall asleep everywhere, just stay at home, man. You're just walking around like a zombie. The guy rolled his eyes. Wow, thanks, Joey. I'm happy to know that you care. They just spitting facts, man. The crowd tittered with Joey, and the kid opened his locker and grabbed his box. I noticed that his hands were trembling. Yep, everyone laugh. Like I'm a friggin' slapstick cartoon. With him joining in with being the butt of the joke, however, the laughter faded into an awkward silence. Joey turned away and started talking to his friends, 
but the kid seemed genuinely confused, still half asleep. I was watching him blinking rapidly, probably disoriented and unsure of where to go, when Connor stepped in front of me. It's not that I don't like you, Mara, he said. I just... It's fine, I cut him off. Dude, it's... it's cool. I played with my ponytail with fervent fingers, at the point that I would gladly welcome a meteor hitting the school. I obviously got the wrong idea. No, no, it's not that, Connor started to say, before his phone vibrated in his hand. I felt mine too in my back pocket. It wasn't just the two of us. I glimpsed other kids pulling out their phones, or if they already had them, frowning down at the screen. Connor had a wiry smile. What's this? Oh, don't look at that, I said. It's just Rory's April Fool's prank. Huh? Connor didn't look up from his phone, and looking around, he wasn't the only one. I was reminded of Rory's prank, what she had told me about a little earlier, when we were headed to school. A monkey. I had raised my eyebrows when she had shoved her phone in front of my face. Rory shook blonde curls out of her eyes. Her smile was enough to brighten my mood. It's a meme. Yeah, I've seen it, I chuckled. It's the stinky one, right? Rory, that meme is like months old. I gripped my backpack strap tighter. This is what you're going to prank people with? The uh-oh stinky meme? It's funny, Rory laughed. Look at it. I pushed the phone out of my face, settling my friend with a smirk. Yeah, but I don't think it's really April Fool's worthy. Rory's eyes glinted. Not yet. Her words took me off guard. Huh? What do you mean? Rory winked at me and ran ahead, and I had no choice but to follow her. Hey, what did you do? And turning to me, Rory was grinning wildly. I bought a thing. A thing. Yeah, I followed this link on Reddit and it brought me to this website where you can, like, buy viruses. It was only like 10 bucks. Her eyes were shining. It's a mass text. She whispered excitedly. Like it connects itself to the network. To everyone's phones and everyone will see it. How cool is that? Rory rubbed her hands together with a grin. And you can't get rid of it either. Unless you turn off your phone. It works like a parasite. Spreading to all forms of technology. Not just phones. She turned to me with childlike glee. Wait, does that mean every device? Like school printers too. Toasters. No, I shoved her laughing. They mean TVs, whiteboards, that kind of stuff. I was suddenly curious. Because this kind of thing, despite being hilarious, it sounded super shady. Where did you find it? No idea. I had to download another web browser. I had a hard time taking in what she was saying. Rory, did you... I trailed off, unable to stop myself. Did you get this off the dark web? She shrugged. I don't think so, it was just a website. Which sounds exactly like the dark web. I groaned. What even is it, like a file? Rory nodded. I guess, I don't actually have it. I just have to give the go-ahead in the IT room. She pulled something from her pocket. A USB drive. They told me that I just have to plug it into any computer and that they'll do the rest. I stopped walking. They? Yeah, they were anonymous. Roy turned to me, folding her arms. Why are you looking at me like that? I continued walking, a little faster this time. Like what? Like you're about to say this is a bad idea. Rory's voice echoed on my mind as I watched Connor Marlo go 15 seconds without looking up from his phone. But not just that. He seemed frozen in place. I jumped when his backpack slid from his shoulder, and it hit the ground with a thump which didn't even phase him. Behind him, a girl dropped her Starbucks latte, and then next to her, another guy's books slipped from his hands. Things were hitting the floor suddenly. Just normal objects. Laptops, coats, drinks. But no phones. 
Something ice cold slipped down my spine when Connor's body seemed to jolt, his fingers tightening around his phone. I glimpsed a puddle of coffee pooling beneath my feet. It was almost like the world had come to a standstill around me. Connor, I managed to find my voice, reaching for my own phone. Rory's video couldn't have been that captivating, I thought. It was just a stupid meme. And then just like that, my world exploded. I'm not sure a point it hit that something was very wrong. Maybe it was when Connor Marlowe lifted his head. The light in his eyes, that very human light that I had recognized in any living person, fizzling out. There was something in the air, something crackling that I felt. I sensed and I heard it. I was too busy staring at Connor, at the visible change in him. A transformation happening directly in front of me which carried in the air, seemingly taking control of every kid around me, bodies jolting, like something was there, crawling into their heads. His body seemed to relax and go limp, but he was still standing like he was suspended on puppet strings. I was choking on words that I wanted to say, wanting to cry out when Joey Summers lunged for a girl near him latching his teeth onto her throat and ripping it out. That started an almost a domino effect. All around me, the kids started attacking each other. A girl threw herself at two guys, and the group of them tumbled down the stairs, clawing at each other. Screams erupted around me, as I was reminded of animals in a zoo. But they weren't animals. They were my classmates. My gaze until then had been on Joey, who was straddling the girl that he had ripped the throat from. Zombies. That was my first thought. But he wasn't eating her. His expression was vacant. The boys seemed to study her with empty eyes, before jumping up and taking off down the hallway and slamming, almost comically, into a door. He was laughing, I realized. Joey was giggling like a child, slamming his face again and again and again into the door. Red splattered at painting wood. I was aware of taking a slow step backwards, but I couldn't tear my eyes off of him. His body slipped to the ground before getting back up. He was still laughing. Again, his head didn't look like a head anymore, after only five blows. A girl with a ponytail grabbed hold of his neck with an animalistic shriek, biting into his face and ripping away the flash. But the two of them were grinning, blank eyes wild like they were enjoying it, like they were really enjoying it. I couldn't move. Rory. Her name clouded my thoughts. Rory, Rory, Rory. My trembling hands gingerly brushed the back of my jeans, fingering my phone. I wasn't thinking. Crap, I wasn't thinking. I had to get to her. Cool hands were suddenly wrapped around my throat and choking the breath from my lungs. I was on my back and Connor was on top of me. His eyes were different. Unlike Joey's and unlike others around us, mindlessly throwing themselves at each other. There was the slightest glint of awareness in his expression. A manic smile was stretched across his face. He was speaking, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. I couldn't breathe. With one hand still gripping my throat, Connor pawed for his phone that he had dropped. I already knew what he was going to do, and I tried to fight back, tried to shove his body off of me, but I couldn't. Not when he was squeezing the breath out of me. Around me, I only saw red, pooling red, but no bodies. Kids with pieces torn out of them, kids with only one eye, a torso that had been torn, spilling glistening innards. They were still moving and contorting around me. But unlike them, Connor was conscious. He was thinking, but his thoughts had been twisted. Giggling like a little kid, he shoved his phone in my face and I squeezed my eyes shut. He was conscious enough to want to show me the video. I thought dizzily. Why? Why had it affected Connor differently? I didn't have enough time to think because his thumbs were in my eyes, pulverizing, and I was screaming. Gotta look. Connor's voice was a hysterical giggle riddled with static. The phone blinked on and off and on and off, like, like it was connected to him. 
Gotta look, gotta look. Pain exploded. Nuclear pain. Pain that I didn't think was possible. That I didn't think I could feel. When I cried out, he let go and shoved the phone into my face. I was looking at exactly what I had seen earlier. When Rory had shown me. A 15 second video of a smiling monkey. And the familiar audio from the meme. I didn't see anything wrong with it at first. But it wasn't the video that was the problem. It was what overlaid it. A low frequency screech rattling my ears. I felt Connor's fingers grasping at my eyes and pulling my eyelids open. And I was forced to watch it. I was forced to drink it in. I won't be fully able to write out what happened to me. Because I still don't know. I only remember his splinters. I remember something snapping inside my head. I felt it. Like something in my brain had been severed, broken, and let loose. I remember a boy coming up behind Connor, wielding a fire extinguisher, and hitting him over the head, over and over again until he was just a mess and unrecognizable. But I found it funny. No, more than funny. Hysterical. I laughed, and others around me joined in. I laughed, and my thoughts grew blurry and disjointed. I stood up, swaying from side to side, and I remember wanting the boy to do it again. I wanted to see Connor's head get smashed. I wanted to see everything splatter on the floor, a look of hopelessness on his face. That's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see him scream. I wanted to see his pain. But I didn't get that. Even when I had grabbed the fire extinguisher myself and continued the attack, Bringing it down on Connor, what was left of him didn't lose its skeletal smile. And he didn't die. He didn't drop. Connor just lay there, his body rattling, trembling with each discarded phone. Listen, I wanted to skip over this part. I wanted to lie to you and pretend that it didn't happen, but it did. I became a puppet to whatever was released. And my only thought was to cause pain. I did unspeakable things to people, and I ate them like it was a snack. I was part of this hive mind, a group of kids with enough consciousness to know what they were doing, but the thing inside of us, the thing wriggling inside of our head, still kept us on a leash. It told us to kill and we did. I'm not sure how many days went by or maybe weeks or months before I was knocked out from behind. Day and night don't exist at Blackwood. Neither does time. Through splinters in my memory, I remember being knocked out from behind. The thing inside me didn't like that. It told me to fight back. It told me to go after the attacker. But then though, something cold was slicing into the back of my neck. And it was the first that I had felt in so long. I'm not sure when the thing let me go or if it was forced to let me go. But when I fully came to, aware of everything that I had done, the kids that I had attacked, I didn't want to stay. I wanted to finally die. I could still taste them on my lips, tainted on my tongue. When I fully came to, I was in a classroom. It had been trashed, of course, and barely looked like a classroom anymore. The doors were barricaded with desks and chairs. The light above flickered. I was tied down to a desk. My arms and legs were bound in rope and something warm pulled down the back of my neck. There was something there though, something soft, cushioning my throat. Well, well, well. A voice spoke up. There was a figure in front of me. Welcome. Test subject number 18. Forgive me for the restraints, but you have tried to attack me multiple times. I've managed to get it out, and judging by your return to sanity, it looks like it worked. I couldn't find my voice for a moment. The whole time, I had been a puppet under that thing's control. I hadn't really used my mouth. Instead, my thoughts projected between the hive mind that we all shared. What? I licked my lips. They tasted like rusty coins. The voice was a guy, and I recognized him, but I wasn't sure where from. 
When the figure in front of me moved closer, it caught the light. A kid my age hiding behind some serious bed hair hanging in his eyes. His smile wasn't quite friendly. He looked more excited. Like I was this cool new specimen that he had just put in a jar. Holy crap. Peering in my face, the kid chuckled. You really are back to normal, huh? Before I could speak, he cleared his throat. Okay, let's get this over with. The guy grabbed something, a notebook, and a pen, twirling the pen between his fingers. Name. At that point, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about myself except that I was a monster. I don't know. He scribbled something down. Uh-huh. How about your age? Do you remember anything about yourself? I did. I remembered that last day. I remembered Connor Marlowe. I remembered him trying to kill me. I shook my head. No. He slammed his notebook shut. Forgive me for being gross, but you want to see it, right? See what? What I got out of you. I was suddenly all too aware of the makeshift bandage around my neck. You got that thing out? Yeah, I used to watch some YouTube tutorials. The guy's lips curled into a smile. I wanted to be a doctor. I struggled to take in his words. In my mind, it was a video that messed with my head. That had caused me to go crazy. I don't understand. How did you get it out? What was there to get out? His eyes darkened. I'm going to call it a root. I had to wait until night to try. I figured out that it seems to leave the brain during night while it hibernates. No idea. Maybe it's taking care of its host. Something inside of my gut twisted. The guy wandered over to a small table and picked something up before making his way back over. In his hands was a Coke can. He peered at it. Not the best container right now, but the science building exploded. Thanks to you guys a couple of weeks ago. Shooting me the side eye, his lips quirked into a smirk. Not that I needed the crap or anything, so this will have to do. Holding the can close to me, the guy hovered it in front of my eyes. You see it? At first, I didn't know what he was talking about before I caught a movement at the bottom of the can. They looked like an octopus tentacle. A single root-like thing coiled at the very bottom of the can. That, the guy pulled the can away, is the stinky uh-oh virus. A crafty little guy. I blinked at him. The what? He shrugged. Let's call it the SUU virus. I prefer the uh-oh stinky though. Reminds me of simpler times. I could only stare at him. No, I said, no, this thing, it's just a video. He nodded. Yeah, it started as one, but stuff evolves, dude. Have you played a play gink? The guy sighed. You've been out of it for like, I don't know, eight months. Things have changed. April Fool's Day. A mass text message was sent to every device in the school and everyone who saw it lost their minds. There are three categories. There are the Walking Dead ripoffs who rejected the virus and went full zombie mode. Then, there are successes, the ones that the virus aimed to make. An army of psychopaths which you were a part of. He lost his smile. They hunt down kids who survived and kept their minds and forced them to watch the video. And that's if they're feeling merciful. I've seen them do a lot of awful things to people, and you were probably a part of it too. And finally, there are kids like me, Kids who forgot to charge their phones that day. The guy shrugged. Or in my case, fell asleep. I tend to do that a lot. Before I could speak, he continued, gesturing around him. All of us living in a so-called utopia ruled by Aurora Michelson, their creator, and who they treat like a dang god. Sticking his fingers down his throat, he pretended to gag. It's messed up. Whatever that thing is, it's taking complete control of her. She's like their queen. I went cold all over. Rory, I whispered. Do you mean Rory? Is that her name? He pulled a face. Yeah, I mean, you'll know what I mean when you see her. When I see her. 
The kid frowned at me before sighing and undoing my restraints. He held out a hand for me to grab and I took it thankfully. He pulled me off the desk. I'm Jasper, by the way. If that thing is still lingering inside of you and you try anything, I won't hesitate taking you out. He smiled wirely. No hard feelings, okay? I struggled to steal myself, my head spinning. How long have I been? I trailed off. One of them. Jasper strode over to the window and pulled back curtains spattered red. I followed him hesitantly. There were bars on the windows, and when I pressed my face against them, I glimpsed a flash of green outside. Jasper had gestured to the bars. They put us in quarantine a day after the outbreak. At first, it seemed like they were helping, but the freaks just ate them when they tried coming in. And then you guys warned them not to step on territory. So, since then, they've pretty much given up on us. They don't want what's in here to get out. It's selfish, but I can see where they're coming from. I was already moving away from him and kneeling on the floor near the door, peering at vine-like roots entangled in the hinge. What is that? He came to kneel next to me. Jasper had lost his smile. When that thing can't take control, it basically explodes in their heads. It doesn't kill them, keeping the body alive. And whatever that is sprouts from their head. It's everywhere, all over the school. It started in the IT room and it spread here. Thankfully, that stuff isn't dangerous without a host. And just like the Sioux virus, it goes to sleep at night. The boy turned to me when I got to my feet. There's something else that I should show you, but we have to be quiet, okay? At these hours, your group sleeps in the corridors and it freaks still roam around at night. Whatever this thing is, it's intelligent and it's built an army of sorts. The ones who didn't go zombie have one mission, and that's to convert survivors. Anyone left lucid, he shuddered. They're her so-called loyal followers, and you are one too. They're probably looking for you, so we have to keep a seriously low profile. Jasper shot me the side eye. Unless you want to go back to them. Ignoring his shy to Mark, I focused on Rory. I need to get her. Rory, I mean. That doesn't sound like a good idea. There are guards. Do you know how to get past them? He frowned. I'm working on it. I managed to brain you, didn't I? I nodded and slowly, Jasper removed the barricades and we stepped out into the corridor. It was pitch black, though my eyes adjusted easily. I asked him why I could see, and he explained it was part of heightened senses triggered by the virus. Jasper wielded a baseball bat and moved quickly, dragging me with him. Thick greenery engulfed the corridors, a root-like plant tangled in every door. If you see a phone, smash it to pieces in the daylight, he said. I didn't understand what he meant until we were kneeling in front of what was left of Connor Marlowe. His body was still intact, still breathing, despite him being nothing but a quivering flash. Jasper used the sleeve of a sweater to pick up a discarded phone next to Connor. The screen flashed on and I flinched. Jasper lay a hand on my shoulder. Cool it. It's dead for now. For now? Yeah, look. Jasper pointed to the screen where something had flashed up. They don't show the video anymore, just this. He sent me a look. I would advise smashing it to pieces during the daytime, though. His words twisted something in my gut as I peered at numbers in glaring green. It looked like they were counting down. They're all connected, Jasper said, nodding at Connor and the bodies around him. You see, whatever happens to them, the phones react to it, and vice versa. When Jasper hovered the phone over Connor, his body rattled, eyes flickering. Beneath me, the ground rumbled. What was that? I hissed out. That, Jasper murmured, is the latest update. He was right. Peering at the numbers, it was at 67% complete. Update, I repeated. For what? No clue. 
This thing has been learning through us. I'm gonna guess that it's bad though. You know, considering they have the ability to shake the earth and play with the lights. As he said that, the bulb above us, the one that I thought was dead, sparkled slightly. Before lighting up, I jumped up, something warm creeping up my throat. I was reminded of what I had been eating for the last god knows how long, and I had to bite into my lower lip to stop myself from barfing. Wait, Jasper hissed out. He fell to his knees, crawling over to Connor. Jasper used the butt of his baseball bat to poke at something moving, slithering on the floor next to Connor's ear. No way, he hissed. That's, that's brain tissue, Jasper said, his voice quivering. It's combined itself through our brain tissue and learned and evolved into a physical form. I peered at the thing, cringing at the way that it squirmed. That's what you got out of me, right? The guy straightened up and turned to me. Yeah. His breath was shuddery. But it's not supposed to be able to survive outside of us. The one that I pulled out of you was dead the second that it touched the can. If this thing can survive outside of us too, we're done for. Because what the heck comes after that? He poked at the thing again. His voice a hysterical breath. He stamped on it, but when Jasper lifted his foot, it was still wriggling, still squirming, before slithering back into Connor's ear. Footsteps erupted, what I was sure was going to be a cry ripping from my throat. Running footsteps. Laughter. Almost a sing-song static noise which crackled on my ear. Mara! Come and play, Mara! Their voices were like a symphony in my ears, reminding me of my name. I, I felt them, if that makes any sense. I felt them coming closer. But the thing that had been inside me was gone. So why did I still feel tethered to them? I caught Jasper's frightened eyes. Mara, he whispered, is that you? I could only nod. Oh crap, it's your friends. Jasper grabbed my hand, flattening us against the wall. We should go. We found a classroom and barricaded the doors. They don't try and get us at night. That's what Jasper said. It's only in the daylight. That was three days ago. Since then, we've been here. We're safe for now, and I can't stop thinking about this update. What does it mean? Jasper told me the internet has been cut off. But in the same breath, he admitted that he's pretty sure that we, all of us together, act like a modem. I don't know how I'm getting a connection, but if anyone's reading, you have to help us and to get us out of here. It's weird. I haven't had time to come to terms with what I've done yet. I know it'll hit me soon. I hope. God, I hope it's fast. Rory's out there, and I've got to find her. I know this wasn't her fault. I know it. Right?